Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Garland Group webinar on social media and compliance, part two, showing some examples. Uh, I'm Brad Garland, the CEO of the Garland Group, and I'll be the moderator and a presenter today. Thank you all for coming. Our format for the webinar today will be about 30 minutes. All the attendees are muted during this time, uh, but that chat box down below, feel free to use it at any point for questions, and Dennis O'Neill is going to be watching for me to make sure there's, uh, if there's any issues with volume, if, uh, if you have any questions at all, feel free to, to submit those in there, and um, during the Q&A time, he'll actually facilitate that for us. Um, all right, before we get into our presentation, a little on the presenters. Our first presenter today is James Robert Le Lay of PTP New Media. Goodness, PTP New Media based out of Pasadena, Texas. <laughs> James Robert is the president of PTP, which is a creative, web, viral, and social marketing consulting company. They offer solutions to organizations who wish to connect and build relationships with their markets in unique and different ways. Over the past eight years, they've worked with over 150 organizations to plan, create, develop, and launch, and maintain non-traditional marketing strategies and campaigns. And since I've already induced, introduced myself, uh, let me just explain a little bit about our company. Uh, the Garland Group provides software and services to help make the compliance process simple and easy. We have a web-based enterprise-wide compliance management application called RiskKey that makes audits, exams, and risk assessments easier. We also have consulting services that are designed to assist you to meet the FFIC regulations and to be continuously compliant. All right, well, we've got a lot to cover today, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this topic was actually so large, we didn't feel like we could handle it in one session, so we wanted to break it up. And uh, the intent of this webinar is to really start providing examples um, on how, uh, how social media issues arise and how to handle the compliance issues that are around them. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand this off to James Robert to kick us off. It's all yours, James Robert. Brad, thank you so much for having me, man. I, I really appreciate it and look forward to uh, having a conversation with you and, and hopefully uh, helping you all listening out today talking social media. Uh, first, uh, we'll kick off on, on what we're going to be discussing on my end is just some good social media examples. And to kind of recap, Brad, your uh, webinar that you did uh, last time, you all talked about a lot of the channels, social media channels that are out there. Um, and there are a ton, but I think the primary thing to focus on is, is what is the most popular ones, and obviously those are like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and blog platforms, but it's important to remember, though, that social media is not a field of dreams. So a lot of times we see financial institutions, they, they get into these channels, they, they create a Facebook page, they get on Twitter, they get a blog, and then they expect... Um, their customers, their members to come and join and interact with them, uh, but it's not a full of dreams. It's not if we build it, they will come. Uh, so what we're going to look at today is some examples of how social media can be used to help connect and build relationships, to have conversations, to help inform, to help educate, and ultimately, like I said, to help build relationships. So if, if you can go ahead and flip on to the next slide for me, Brad, that would be awesome. I, before before talking about some examples, though, remember it is important to have a strategy uh, to win. It's not let's just get into social media and figure it out as we go along. Uh, taking the time to plan ahead before launching any kind of social media strategy, social media campaign, will you will go so much farther. So go ahead and hit the next slide. And when we talk about social media strategy, I always like to say there are three steps. Uh, first and foremost is to listen. Uh, the second one is to learn, and the third one is to engage. And to listen, learn, engage is a good high 30,000 foot strategy. But remember, uh, when we talk about social media, it's, it's, we, we can't take what we've done in the past and broadcast out messages and have this you know, one direction uh, broadcast going out from our organizations. Uh, like I said, listen, learn, engage, and we'll we'll see this process, these three steps, as we take a look at some uh, real social media examples and success stories. And so to first start off with, we're going to take a look at at more of a of a scary situation um, and and how a financial institution 
uh, was able to communicate during a crisis. And this all started out with something that I think he would keep a lot of us in, in the compliance side and the IT side awake at night. The financial institution's website was compromised. And uh, back in the day, uh, before social media, we were kind of in a position to where it was just sit and wait and hope you know that this situation would be resolved very quickly. Uh, the the losses would be minimal. Members' information or, or, or customers' information would not be affected. Um, but now during uh, this time and using social media, the financial institution was able to be proactive about this negative situation as opposed to being reactive. They were actually able to use multiple social media channels to help do a couple different things. First, they started out uh, with sending out an immediate email informing uh, their customers about the situation. The next thing that they did was get a, a blog post up very, very quickly to say, hey, this is what's happened. Um, and, and we want you to know about it. Third, they were able to use uh, Twitter to, to once again spread the message and ultimately use, use the other channel that they were using was Facebook. Now, all of these helped do uh, a couple different things. Obviously, the email was, was a quick alert to get it out. But when we looked at how the blog was being used, the blog was used to be transparent, uh, to, to let their customer know what was happening, but also to to listen back and allow their customers to interact with them on the blog. They were also able to listen via Twitter to hear about any potential complaints, um, you know, concerns, and immediately respond to those to, to those concerns that their customers had. And then finally, engage as well uh, on Facebook. And the important thing to note here is that there was email involved, there was their blog involved, there was Twitter involved, there was Facebook. So all these these channels were involved to communicate one message to take a a very negative situation and turn it around and, and ultimately the response from their customers was very positive because they were transparent about the situation uh, and and taking a negative one and, and turning it into somewhat of a positive situation via social media. As we move on, we'll take a look at another example about how another financial institution was able to take quick action after the storm. Two years ago, um, Hurricane Ike rolled into South Texas, and there was a financial institution uh, that was able to have a blog up and running 36 hours after the hurricane came through and devastated the area that they served. Uh, this blog was used as a way, as almost a, a community platform to help connect people together. And so essentially what the blog was doing, it was serving as a way to listen to the needs of, of the community and then connect the community together. Because the blog, the, the, the concept and the idea behind the blog was share your story. What do you need to help you after the storm has come through? Do you need food? Do you need clothing? Do you need shelter? And so the blog was able to listen to these, these stories, share them with everyone else in the community, and then other people in the community were, were able to help out. And so it, using social media, using the blog, using the principles of listen, learn, and engage, they were able to uh, improve their brand awareness within the community without a, a, in a non-traditional way, without using any kind of traditional kind of sales and marketing. So another very powerful example of how social media can be used almost in a time of crisis to help uh, improve a situation to connect people together to help one another out. Yeah, Dave, Robert, the, the, for the, the compliance folks too, I mean, business continuity is something that they have to think about as well. And you know, sure. oftentimes they think about, um, you know, what do we need to do to make sure that we're prepared uh, where are our plans, things like that, um, and they of, often think in a physical sense, but this is a really great example on how they could still create that transparency and awareness of, hey, we're dealing with this too, and then these guys, I really like that example because they took it a step further of, okay, now how can we help you uh, get out of the crisis as well, so that's a great example, thanks. Sure thing. 
And and so yeah, I mean, you know, look, you talk about um, disaster planning, disaster recovery. I think social media channels must be built in uh, for to to help inform our customers uh, and, and members about the situation um, at hand, what the financial institution is doing, what is the next step, um, but also they can be used internally to help communicate as well uh, to keep make sure everybody's on the same page. And then the last example is listen and respond. Um, this is another uh, really, really neat story that uh, a financial institution was able to use social media for. Um, there was a negative comment that had been posted on YouTube uh, under a video in, in, the, in the comment field. And the, cred, uh, the, the financial institution was able to listen and respond using their RSS reader. They had set up Google Alerts based upon their brand. And so one day, this comment came through the Google Alerts. And the financial institution was able to say, "Hey, this is, you know, this is not good. It's detrimental to our brand." They went on to the YouTube site under the video and responded to this to post. And Brad, if you actually go to the next slide, you can see how this dialogue uh, uh, was 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 played out. So you had this angry customer who's going off. Um, they're angry about being charged bank fees, and so the. The FI was able to respond and say, you know, this is not exactly, you know, what what we want you to feel. Um, we're listening to you. You can give me a call personally, and we'll get everything you know, taken care of. And it was interesting to note also that the angry customer responded back to the financial institution's rep, said, "Thank you so much. Everything's taken care of." And so this is just another example of once again, listen, learn and engage well, to be successful on social media. Yeah. And to your point too, I mean, so what you're saying is that these guys weren't even actively monitoring specifically YouTube. They just had kind of a generic alert out there that was scanning anything that was happening on the web and they picked it up through one of those searches or one of those uh, subscriptions that they had. And that's exactly. how they were able to drill down. That's interesting. There's so many, I mean, you know, when we look at all the different social media channels out there, the big three, Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube and blogs are the big four. You cannot be actively monitoring all of this, and so the best way to go around uh, about this is to set up um, a RSS reader, an RSS feed with Google Alerts with your brand name, and then you can hear the conversation of how your brand is being talked about in the social world in both a negative and positive way, and respond to those situations. Absolutely. So ultimately, once again, you know, social media strategy: three things: listen, learn, and engage. And and don't don't just broadcast the message because it's it's really all about the conversation and ultimately building relationships and 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 improving your brand awareness in a positive manner. Right on. Well, thank you, James Robert. Let me kind of uh, take it over a little bit from here. Um, you know, my angle. Uh, that I wanted to to talk more of was more on the back end side and how the um, those processes and how the employees that are responsible for this role of social media how you know what are some of the considerations we need to have and so I kind of wanted to start out at uh, the policy and procedures ang uh, angle uh, if if you as institutions have not put a policy together uh, here's some you know high level details on, on what you can consider. Um, you know, for one, I've seen a variety of different ones from, I mean, literally one line policy um, to, um, I think the policy was actually don't do anything you wouldn't want your mom to see, uh, to, you know, just pages and pages and pages of policies of all the different networks. I obviously kind of fall somewhere in the middle that, you know, you want to cover your bases, but you don't want to overcomplicate for a variety of different reasons, but um, also for the fact that these technologies are coming out every day. And so it's really more about the conversation than it is the tools and what to say and who should who should, should goodness should say it and and go from there. Uh, secondly, you know, planning for a little uh, ambiguousness. Uh, those adjustments are going to happen along the way, and then ultimately to you know train your people. Whether you know initially you train that dedicated team that's focused on looking at this sort of stuff uh, to training everybody out there uh, because you know even your tellers and everybody else are using these tools too. They might see a comment out there that talks about um, 
you know, the institution that they work for, and they might want to respond to that. Well, you probably have a certain um, etiquette as to how you want to deal with those situations. So whether it be that teller notify the social media team or whatever the case may be, or person. Um, this policy that you see here, uh, it's just a sample policy that uh, we will provide um, on that um, blog post on Monday that I was referring to. Um, and you can download that PDF to, to kind of start if you'd like. So that'll be available to everybody that's listening. Um, now, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, how some of these banks, uh, financial institutions, are actually using these, um, these different mediums. And this is a very specific one. And I want to just kind of show you the different roles that B of A, in this case, are playing. Uh, now, one thing to note is, you know, they've got about 9,000 followers that are following every single thing that they say. Um, you would think, why would they be uh, following them? But there's obviously a certain relationship that's being established there. Now, I know through B of A's case, they originally started with one guy that was responsible for all this. And as you can see on this page, they now have a team of up to six and they have a little uh, signature at the end of each of these tweets to indicate who it is, again, to kind of connect them on a personal level on um, when they're having these conversations. And so let's, let's go through a couple of the roles that just this one account is playing for B of A. Uh, for one, they are a complaints department. Uh, you have to read this kind of from bottom up, but uh, you know, a tweet came out from this, uh, this young lady that just flat out says, I hate B of A. Uh, and you can see that they had come back and responded within an hour that says, hey, I work for B of A. Uh, what happened? Is there anything that I could do to help? Now, uh, you know, they weren't necessarily following this lady. They were also monitoring kind of the, the Twitter sphere in this regard, seeing if uh, Bank of America pops up or B of A pops up and just wanted to come back to say, hey, there is a, an open ear here and we're willing to listen. And is there anything else we can do to help? So they're facilitating just a simple complaint this way. Uh, another role that they play is just simple customer service. Um, music biz kid here said the, the live chat guy just closed our session without answering my question. Uh, thanks, but no thanks. He's obviously frustrated there. And so they followed up. Again, you can see within an hour here of basically saying, hey, we got your message. Uh, we'll give you a call at uh, during the requested hours tomorrow. Uh, follow us in case we need a DM. DM stands for direct message, which is kind of a private message. So they've decided here that whatever this guy's issue was, that they, they actually um, need to take it offline. They need to take it in a private form uh, because you can't solve a lot of these customer service questions publicly. And so they have a clear line of, of demarcation to know, all right, we need to take this offline. We just need to talk over the phone to really um, complete the service out. And then, you know, one thing that we often talk about in, in fear the negative, but I think we should also talk about, you know, the positive feedback that comes in. And so here's one from Brittany Dane saying, hey, it's 4.30 in the morning. I just had the best customer service experience from B of A. Good way to start the day. And, um, you know, that's 4.32 in the a.m. And, you know, a few hours later they came back and just said, thank you for the positive feedback. We'll pass it on to the associate and the leadership team. Um, to, to just kind of, you know, build those guys up. So not only can you use it as a mechanism to solve problems, but also to, you know, help out your own internal culture and really, you know, promote when the people are doing, when your people are doing a good job, that, you know, that that, that gets sent around to them. So you definitely don't want to discredit the positive stuff as well. Um, you know, one thing to also take into consideration for things like this is actually, um, you know, your own back-end systems. All of these systems are obviously public, um, but are there any notes or um, any sort of um, memos that you want to put in your CRM systems, in your um, core, core systems to make notes about these providers or about these conversations that you've been having um, just to, you know, provide a better customer service experience? And so uh, I really feel like, um, you know, in the future, some of the systems that we have today, like the core systems, are actually going to be uh, incorporating not only the bank account information, but also uh, some of these online accounts as well. Um, food for thought. Well, let's talk about um, kind of the bad. Uh, in this case, pretty bad. Now, I had to go to a, a, another company. This isn't a financial institution. but. Uh, just to show you the ramifications of how a big blow up can actually turn into a, uh, a good story on how to mediate the risk here. Um, this is a, a social media disaster with Southwest Airlines. 
and it's in regards to a guy named Kevin Smith. And if you guys know or don't know Kevin Smith, he has kind of a cult-like following. He is a writer-director. He's been doing uh, a bunch of movies for many years. Uh, recently did uh, Cop Out with Bruce Willis and Tracy Morgan. Is that right? I don't remember his name. Um, anyway, so he, he's a director, and he's got about 1.6 million million followers on Twitter. Well, the story goes that he was on standby on a Southwest flight. Uh, he got on the plane, but he didn't make the weight requirement for the seat. And so if, um, if you are too big to fit into a single seat, you're required to buy two seats. Well, it was a full flight. There was only one seat available, and so they had to actually kick him off the flight. Uh, well, you know, they obviously didn't know what this guy's social media presence was, but he got off the flight very angry, upset about it, and posted this. Um, and since then has really posted a number of times. Now I just want you to notice a few things here. One is, you know, he's got 1.6 million followers that immediately get these posts. Secondly, there's a function within Twitter that's called a retweet, which is really just kind of like a forward on email. Uh, well, the people that get these messages can retweet to their own networks of hundreds or thousands in their case. And so you're probably looking at a, a message span of two to three million mentions uh, for this sort of complaint. And so obviously this created a massive kind of firestorm for Southwest. And, um, you know, they immediately needed to come up with a plan on it. So here's how they actually handled it. Within 15 minutes, um, they actually responded back to him via Twitter. Southwest Airlines has a really good social media presence themselves. Uh, so one thing that they always do that James Robert, you know, had mentioned is just be sure that you're monitoring and you're checking out what's going on. And so they saw that message come in. They replied back directly to Kevin Smith within 15 minutes and just apologized for the problems he's having, suggested that, you know, he could talk to them if they needed to. Um, over, moreover than that, they realized who they were dealing with after that. The next day they came out with a blog post just publicly talking about the incident, again apologizing profusely about it. And, um, you know, just being very transparent in the way that the, they handled the situation. Um, and, you know, they took the tone. You can handle these in a couple of different ways. You could just not talk about it and just kind of be cold. You could take an aggressive tone and tell your audience why this person is wrong and why they didn't meet requirements or whatever. But they took, they were kind of hu um, humble in their regard. And because of that, they really managed this sort of disaster in the best way that they could. And so when they did that blog post, um, they kept that humility. And a lot of the comments to that blog post very much sided with Southwest with, you know, this, this isn't a perfect ending. Uh, you you kind of had to do that. You're obviously hurting people's feelings a little bit, but I understand where you guys are coming from. And so, um, you know, it's just an example of the, it's not, you know, the perfect ending story, but it's definitely something that it could have been much, much worse. And because they were monitoring and they were responsive and they were humble, uh, they were really able to provide uh, as good of an experience as they could. <coughs> uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention, um, we've got a couple more minutes here, is a 99-1 principle that a lot of people don't know about in regards to communities, in, in regards to these different networks. Um, Jake McKee uh, actually came up with this concept, and essentially what it, it says is that all of these networks, uh, Twitter's one, Facebook's one, LinkedIn's one, kind of follow this general 99-1 principle, stating that, you know, 90% of the audience that's just sitting back and following you um, aren't really, are, are doing just that. They're very passive. They're not going to uh, respond or comment on anything that you say. So if you're creating these blog posts, you're creating these Twitter accounts, the vast majority of people are just listening. And the tough thing about where we are with, with, with the web, it, it's hard to really track that uh, short of you know, visitors on the site. The 9% are the people that are really just repliers. So they're the ones that after someone posts a blog post, they'll come back in and post a comment to that. But they won't actually be the instigator of the content. They won't create it themselves. It's really that 1%. Um, and oftentimes it's those Kevin Smiths of the world that have quite a big following that uh, are in that creator role of actually producing stuff. And so um, my point here being is that even though you're monitoring, even though you're looking for people to talk about you, doesn't necessarily mean that the vast majority of people aren't listening and judging your brand based off of what other people are saying. And so for the few that do, it's very um, 
it's very important to make sure that you handle all of those issues very carefully and, and mindfully because it's not just them that you're dealing with, you're dealing with a much larger, larger audience that's mainly just passively listen, listening. Uh, another thing that I kind of wanted to wrap up with was just a book recommendation. Uh, this book has is, uh, is, uh, recently come out in the past couple of weeks uh, by Brett King, and if you're looking to kind of think about this and think about you know, where is the, the bank branch going, what is it going to look like in the future, what is banking going to look like in the future, how does it play around with all these social networks, uh, I would really recommend this book by Brett King. He's also on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash Brett King, um, and you could follow him as well. But it's a really good book that uh, you can get out on Amazon, and um, I, I just wanted to recommend it in case you wanted to get some in-depth reading into how the customer behavior is changing. Uh, okay, and so you know, with that, that about wraps up what we want to share with you today. Uh, I want to let everyone know uh, that this presentation, as well as the sample social media policy, will be available on our blog uh, at thegarlandgroup.net slash blog no later than Monday. Um, so if you have questions, Denny, I'm going to kind of pass it off to you and uh, help us with uh, the questions. Okay. And actually, I, Brad, actually, I just added in a link um, that expands on Brett King's thoughts. Um, there's something that Sapient, Nitro, uh, Brett King, and Gizio put together. It's an okay. uh, interactive white paper about engagement bait. It's pretty Excellent. cool stuff. Thank you. Cool. That's great. Thanks a lot, you guys. I, I think it really is valuable to talk about the examples to really see what's working and what's not working. And what uh, I was thinking about listening to what you all were talking about, I, I went back to what you had said, Brad, in the webinar last month in, in the part one of this. And that was that uh, just as compliance is not only the responsibility of the compliance department, Social media is not only the responsibility of the communications department. When you see the breadth of uh, contact that you showed there, Brad, I mean, it, the enterprise really has to take this serious from the you know entire institution uh, perspective. So we do have a, a couple of questions, though. Uh, Brad, this this one question uh, is more on the network side uh, from that you know, coming from that direction. So let me put this to you. So what is the best practice for opening up these services to our network? Uh, is there any sort of regulation guidance for us? Uh, sure. So um, I would say, you know, short answer is really uh, there's not, not really any sort of guidance. Um, but what we are generally suggesting to our clients is, uh, again, it kind of goes back to when you define the policy. Um, you, you want to definitely open that up to those that need the ability to monitor. Uh, however, you don't want to limit, um, you don't necessarily limit uh, all of the internet um, to that. And so generally what we found is uh, designating a certain set of people um, where they have that ability to see those sites and then you make that decision about whether you want to close that for everybody. But what we've also found is that those that have a little bit more uh, liberal um, social media policy, oftentimes people that aren't associated with the ones responding are able to find those comments when they are, mo you get more people monitoring basically, uh, and they can pass that off to the team to respond appropriately. Uh, it just kind of distributes the workload a little bit better. So. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I appreciate that. And, and uh, James Robert, I would like to pose this to you. The, question is really about the examples. It, it says, oh, so you have showed some examples on how social media can be used in certain situations, which is great, but what about the day in, day out situations? What should we be sharing? Sure. Thanks so much for the question. I think the biggest thing is, once again, it kind of goes back to creating a, a long-term strategy and plan so that you just don't wake up uh, in the morning, you go in and think, oh, what should I what should I post on Facebook today or what should I post on Twitter today? Um, by having a plan, by having it's more of a, uh, what I would like to call a content strategy uh, to, to where you have predetermined topics or even articles or, or short little blurbs about um, financial topics, financial health, financial education that are ready to go uh, during a certain time period or certain calendar. That will help you out so that you're not just sitting there broadcasting out the latest rates, broadcasting out regurgitated marketing material, 
I think the other thing also is being being flexible um, and you know if something does come up being able to have a policy in place to where you can have a little bit of creativity to answer certain questions or have conversations without having to go um, you know and, and, and respond two days later three days later once something is approved but having someone who is trusted who can manage these conversations for you mm-hmm Oh, that's great, and it's it's great to have your experience on that too, James Robert. I I have a I have a, another question here, just real quick, and this is actually a great question for uh, for the whole group. And that is that uh, part two. You know, is there a way to find access to it? Since uh, we did have a, an attendee today that missed part one, and sure. so I do want to say that if you go to the GarlandGroup.net and under Spotlight, which is uh, on the home page you'll see our webinar uh, archive, and, and we also have it in our blog. Is there another place, Brad? Or can you yeah, our list of webinars are at thegarlandgroup.net slash webinars, and that can get to all of the other previous recordings, but part one should be at the top, so um, that'll get them there as well. Perfect, perfect. Well, that's it on my side, Brad. All right, great. Well, um, you know, I, I want everybody to know that you can reach James, Robert, and I via email at the emails you see listed here. Feel free to send us any further questions you may have. Uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, we do these webinars every month. Uh, there's also risk key training on the third Friday of every month. And our next webinar topic will actually be on October 1st, we'll, 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 where we'll be moving uh, to another hot topic of regulation, which is actually Regulation E. Uh, so I just want to say thanks to James Robert for helping us out, and uh, thanks everybody for coming. And this will conclude our webinar, and we hope everybody has a great weekend.